Hi everyone, I'm Jace Haskell and you're listening to What A Flanker. My guest today is a good friend of mine, a former England international, 97 caps, a leader amongst men, uh, a rabble rouser, um, a rap sheet longer than, uh, I don't know who's got a longer rap sheet than you, but it's, ladies and gentlemen, it's Dylan Hartley. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. <laughs> I'm trying to think what time of day it is. Hello, it's a Friday. We're, we're the, yeah, we're finishing the week strong. We are finishing the week strong. I've actually... I'm actually looking forward to just hammering through this so we can go for a drink. Yes, I'm very excited. And do you know what the best thing about being retired, and we both are retired because our bodies are fucked, is um, we well, can actually... Stop playing the victim, right? Oh. Stop moaning. <laughs> Well, you're like, you're not cap- Rugby's great for well, you. You're not captain in here, but you're not captain here. It, it does every time you do tell me off. It does almost feel like I'm you're in charge again. Like you're you know like you're gonna just fucking bollock me at some point. You're quite I'll intimidating. Never do that. No, you're you're my henchman. Do you, you do, are always my henchman. Do you know you are intimidating? No. You know you know you are. Like you, has no one ever told you intimidating? That is weird. I try not to be intimidating. I'm my like wife big... genuinely genuinely like loves you like your, your mates. I know that, but she's a bit scared. You make you, you're a bit scary. Wow, I'm not coming around your house anymore. <laughs> well, not when I'm not there anymore. But yeah, <laughs> not again. Not again. <laughs> why is Dylan leaving again? Oh, no, maybe but, that's why she's intimidated. But do you, do you maybe know, she's no. You dominated her. No, it's all right. It's a fucking we can. No, we can. Let's not go there. Um, Wife swap with Dylan Hartley and James Haskell. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> but have you? No, no. Do you know what? No one's ever told me that. Have you not? No. I, do you think, I, I wonder why, I wonder if, because I tried to analyse it, because I know what a warm-hearted bloke you are. But and I know, you know what I'm capable of. Yeah, no, I know, but I know you're physical, and I know that you're, you, 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 but you're, but you're direct. I just think maybe it's because you, maybe you're reserved, or maybe, or maybe, uh, I, I, you, I don't know, maybe I feel, I feel like you sometimes control yourself. Do you know what I mean? Especially as you become more, more, more successful and, and when you're in your role as England captain, maybe you, I don't know. Uh, I, I figured out in, in that role it was better to say nothing than to say a whole lot of stuff yeah. and you probably struggle with that yes. concept because you talk and talk and talk and talk and talk yeah. you make a whole lot of sense and some other shit kind of falls out sometimes Yes. Um, whereas I kind of learned to bite my lip and say and I, I tell you what working for Eddie he's a, um, he's big on words the power of words so every time i spoke to eddie i'd have to talk at this sort of cadence to make sure the next word was the right word because he would pull you up on something what do you mean you hope or what do you mean you want to do something like you've really? got to Is that do bad? something yeah well yeah he just said like every time you communicate uh in the media post match speeches in front of the room every time you have coffee he drilled this into me you're communicating with the team whether it's me and you, uh, me and you are slightly different actually, but if you sat down in a group of four or five, you know, having a sappuccino, everyone's chucking this shit out. I was really conscious not to be too heavy uh, with the morale sapping. Like don't be too negative because if I kind of portrayed my way in a certain way, the the group or that group of people would see that as acceptable and then that would filter onto the rest of the team. So Eddie drilled that into me. Um, Did you find that hard? Yeah, really hard. But but then like the the media, I, I, I tell an example of um, I got a bad headline after a press conference, and he basically said I can go home and not be part of the team, because if they wanted a media pop star, someone that wanted headlines about himself, James Haskell could be the captain. <laughs> yeah, the genuine. Yeah, genuine. No, I don't know if you're saying this. Yeah. And um, I, I learned then and there because I worked for him. I worked for the RFU or for Northampton, and I was a representative of the t- uh, representative of the team. It didn't matter what I thought. It was the team's values and the coach's direction and opinions that I needed to communicate. So maybe reserved or maybe um, calculated. Maybe I'm kind of thinking about what comes out of my mouth. <laughs> so, so when you were captain of Northampton, right? So for those of you who don't know, Dylan's talking about um, Eddie Jones, the England coach. Um, you know, Dylan, how, how many years have you been playing at Northampton for? Or were? Um, I did. 14 or 15 seasons, I'm not sure. And when were you captain? When did you start being captain? Uh, I was youngest premiership captain at 20-something, um, and I did eight years of it in total. So you look back now at how you were as a, as a captain in terms of your of your leadership and how you were under Eddie and how structured you were. Were you sort of winging it and just leading with emotion and uh, your on-field kind of aggression? And then when you became England captain, you were much more calculated with the same aggression and determination. Yeah, it's, it's, I suppose it's like you. The older you get, the wiser you become, the yeah. more mature. You learn things that doesn't work. You you know, um, It's all part of 
growing as a person, I think. But when it, when I was young, I, I had no idea what I was doing. But I was very fortunate that I had good people around me, um, good kind of senior leaders, guys that had been there and done it. And there was no egos from them. You know, you know, if a young guy gets captaincy now, it's almost like people want to see them muck up and yes. not be successful. Yeah, I was just very fortunate that uh, I had older guys that invested in me, looked after me. Uh, I could go up to them before a game and say, "Can you take care of?" Because you know, as a young captain, the hardest thing to do is to do team talks. Yes, the rest of it's easy. You yeah. just play the game, and when you're that young, and I'm talking 15 years ago. There was no strategic meetings. There was no... You had to organise socials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do the on-field stuff. Yeah. That was about it. And you, regroup after a loss and shit like that. And make set, sure you set the tone tasks. for yeah, the week. Yeah. And I always trained hard. I was always a confrontational player. So, because I wasn't that skillful or athletic, I just trained. I had a certain ethic to my training and playing. So, I think that kind of helped with credibility amongst my peers. But the other thing I did... Um, the older boys love this as well. Because uh, I, I was young and uh, free and single at the time, I declared that all team socials were just for the boys only. And like you go to a team social now, and it's like, oh, this is my wife. And my, <laughs> yeah, these yeah. Are my three kids, and like, you'll sit down at a restaurant, and have an intimate dinner. Whereas at twenty one, twenty two, I was in charge of team socials, and I was like, no partners allowed. And all the older boys loved that; they absolutely loved it. So like the young guys just followed um, because you know. That's what it did. But the older guys, I think I kind of bought credit through having kind of just the boys kind of social. Yeah, that's like setting setting a stall out and just like, keeping oh, that. They had to go home to their wives and say, oh, sorry, no, girlfriend. The captain said that. Well, uh, the captain's only 15. Tell the little <laughs> fucker, babe, I can't. I can't do that. But um, yeah, I, I basically grew. You know, I, I learned. And every time someone like, um, you know, Phil Delson. Yes. So he, he kept in at Newcastle for a period of time. And Newcastle were bottom of the league you know, every year. And I looked at him and he was such a kind of rounded individual in terms of he was articulate, he played well, he always performed. Um, and he was leading a team that was losing all the yeah. time. So I had people like Douse in my corner, uh, Tom Wood, who's our friend, uh, I had Nacho Lobe, um, who's a big Argentinian. And when anyone talks in like broken English or, or you know, pidgin English, yeah. it sounds way better. Right. So yeah, like yeah, he used yeah. to just um, uh, huff and puff and, and shout and, in, in is it Spanish? Yeah, yeah. Um, which was quite good. Um, Neil Best, Roger Wilsons, these older guys, Bruce Rehana, uh, Carlos Spencer, Paul Tupai, kind of all black legends. I had around me, so it was so easy. And then, as you grow, you know, you watch how those guys conduct themselves, how they speak at the front of the room, uh, how they round off points, because you know you you can waffle. People yes, can waffle, of course. So just I always kind of watched and learned and. I didn't get it right. Like even now, I, I still get it wrong. But I always try and use every time I get to take the stage as a chance to improve. And I think, how did I open that, you know, speech, or how did I close it? How could I do it better yeah. next time? And I know because speaking to you, you're the same. You're always trying to develop your, your patter. You're trying to get better. So as I kind of grew in that that captaincy role, I just had good people around me. I watched. I learned. I had input. And then when I got to Eddie, he just kind of um, fine-tuned it and, and made me think a different way. Did you find it hard, that realisation, that what you were saying uh, could have an impact on, on anybody? Do you know what I, so what I mean by that is you said, you know, not sapping too much, that, you know, you're, you're a big personality. We like to have a joke and a laugh. That's part of your makeup. I'm very, I'm very similar. If I started getting into the fitness trainers or being really moany, it wasn't a problem for me because I didn't have the responsibility. What stage did you realise that? Did you realise that in Northampton or was it only in England you realised that you had to kind of define how you were? Uh, I think, again, as I got older, uh, you understand it more. Is think... it easier at club? It's easier at club maybe to do it because... Sorry, easier at England to do... Um, sorry, it's easier to be yourself at club than with England because you've got different people, whereas... You know, clubs like a mob mentality kind of situation. I think international rugby, you're on show the whole time. So, okay. are you acting? I suppose you're acting the whole time. You're always putting your best foot forward, and you're always making conscious decisions to do the right thing, do the best thing, overtly. You know, like be seen to be doing the right thing. And I think that's part of being a good professional, and that kind of probably drove me to to be better at what I did. But at club level, you you've got to understand you are a key influencer as an international player, as, as a captain. And 
do you know what? it's like giving the naughty kid in class a uh, responsibility like yeah. a job yeah. and it's like you yeah. you know if you've got in every squad there'll be like three four five key influences in that squad if if you can win those kids over whether they're the noisy kids the naughty kids the the, the bully kids the big strong kids if you can or the, or the smart kids if you can win those kind of key influences yeah. in, in any group of people i reckon you've got good control over the group if, you, if you're if you're eddie jones if yeah. you're a boss you know but did you look did you because you said that with getting the guys around you in northampton do you pick up that quite early that is, if you control the mob if you control the key your life's gonna be made a lot easier well we, we it's funny you call it the mob the, the team was referred to as the mob um there was days where we didn't want to train some days and um <laughs> we the mob would just sit in the the change room and say we're not training um you know this this is this is years ago yeah yeah but um and we'd actually get afternoons off because the mob was uh, i would quietly go talk to jim mallander and say right. the boys are pretty tired um you know can, can we have the afternoon off and this would only be once in a, a blue moon yeah yeah but um he kind of said okay the boys can go off but i wouldn't let the boys know that and then they'd be going and i'm like we're not training we're not training <laughs> everyone start like bang the lockers saying we're not training we're not going out and then you know, 15 minutes later, we're not actually training. But it's, so that the boys think they've had like a massive win. Yeah, yeah, But yeah. I've done some like underhand yeah. kind of negotiating on, on there. But that is, I think that's the key to, to, to being the leader, knowing how to play to both sides, knowing where your bread's buttered and, and playing the game. Because it is a it is a PR game a lot of time. Oh, do you know what? I think um, for anyone listening that, that looks at captaincy as uh, like a, an, an honour or... It, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. But... Ultimately, it's it's an extra job, you know. You become management, so you know you look at what Owen Farrell does on a Saturday at the moment, or what I had to do: leads the team out, does the coin toss. Um, other than that, like you don't see, you know, he makes some big on-field decisions, yeah. but nine times out of ten, they're pretty clear and obvious decisions. And then it's the it's the Monday or the Sunday to Friday that you don't see is where a captain, yeah is the captain. And it's funny because everyone looks at it and goes, the best player should be the captain. It's like, no, it's the guy that's the, probably the least obvious guy. That's probably where I fell into that. The, the guy that is not the star, but the guy that's probably got to earn his place, which yeah. I to do and work above and beyond. Um, because, yeah, it's just but crazy. I, don't, I, I agree with what you're saying about, you know, the stupidity of, of, of young kids when you pick people at school. Young it's always kids. the best players. That, young kids. I mean, you get grown men saying this guy should be captain. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, you do not even know the personality yeah, of that guy. Uh, uh, that yeah. guy is an absolute recluse. Yes, he might be the best player in the team, and he might look like the best captain, but he doesn't talk to anyone. I, want, the team. I want to come on to that because that's a fucking great point. Well, let's get on to it. Well, like, <laughs> it, it actually pisses me off. It's usually the most unassuming person. And do you know what? Captaincy for me is almost about people skills as well. Yes. Making sure a team's talking to each other, being able to communicate with people in, in difficult situations, yeah. being able to yeah, yeah, yeah. bring people together. And people don't see that. And the only person who sees that is a head coach who spends all this time and knows these guys inside out. Yeah. He knows the person that can connect people and and manage people. But yeah. Man, we will it's... go on to that. Because what I was going to ask you was, is that you said about you know the, the stupid idea that the best player has to be the uh, has to be the captain. And then you know, you saying that you had to work hard and almost by working hard, you 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 led by example, and it made you better. I actually think what you've shown me today is, I, and I knew because I, I know you're a very intelligent guy, and I know your, your mind's always worrying because I see how you read situations. But it's very interesting that a you've admitted to utilizing uh, people around you. Because in what a flanker, I said one of the best things about your your Neil captaincy was when you spoke, we listened, but you made use of the guys around you. You you know you you utilize the mob, but also the fact that you are in tune enough to understand the different dynamics that are at play, which already makes you a good leader. Because I think some people with leadership think it's just making a speech, but it's not. It's how's he? How am I speaking to the group? What's he thinking over there? How do I do that? that that's what makes you a good leader, I, I think. Do, do, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, 100% agree. But there's things, I think, buying credit with, with people. And I played with people in, in that England team that were not necessarily... My, my social circle because yes. I was a bit older. These guys, some ten years younger than us. Yeah, but I kind of had their confidence in yeah. terms of. Like, I, I can't even tell you some of the things that guys came to me with, and I would just report directly to Eddie. Um, like 
I, I can't even say here, but guys like struggled with with personal issues yeah. at home, and you know with a relationship or uh, I don't know, just yeah. But you can, you there's don't loads to, of you things. Can, you can there's tell loads of things. You don't have to tell but people. But you can I think when you buy out. that credit and yeah. and you kind of keep that secret yeah. and you know and you just check in on them when no one else is looking, you kind of buy that credit with your teammates and um. I'm, I'm, well, people just don't see that, do they? That's they so don't interesting. See that yeah, people, people don't see that because because that kind of flows on nicely to the bit. Is that the media, people, and the public just they think it is? Uh, you know, he's the best player. He should be captain, um, and we're just going to wheel him out. Like I remember, I love Marrow, but I remember when Marrow first came in the group, and they were like, "Marrow should be captain," and I was like, "No, he fucking shouldn't," because he's not. He doesn't speak particularly loudly. He doesn't have the, and he's still trying to master his trade. I think. Would he be a good captain as he's developed? Yes, I think he probably would do. But but people earmarked him straight away. I was like, no. And I'd say this to his face. I said, I said to him, I didn't think at that particular time we're talking, you know, you know, when they were talking about getting rid of Chris Robshaw and going into the World Cup or whatever, or before you were announced, they were throwing names around. I was like, they throw Owen's name around. I was like, Owen then, I don't think would have been a good captain. I'll tell you why. Because he didn't have the emotional balance between being so focused. You can't just be focused on rugby. You have to be like you. You have to understand that, yes, I have to be the best version of myself, but there is so much more to the job. And the media just don't get that. No, I, th- I think, um, again, I look at Mara and Owen as probably your best players. Yes. Some, your two world-class yes, players. Yes, I agree, yeah. And um, and th- this is credit to Owen being world-class at what he does and world-class enough that he's got time to be a captain as well. Yeah. Like, it, you, you kind of want your world-class players to just be players, not not burden them. You you want to pick like the, the fat unathletic un- 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 kid to you know that's desperate to get in the team. You make him the captain, mm. so he he I'm talking about myself here works overtime to earn his place yes. in the team, and yeah. he pulls it all together. And I think that's the sort of um, you know j- it's just my opinion on on captaincy. We will never understand it from looking from the outside. It's only internally it will make sense, uh, and you've got to trust whoever's kind of appointing that position. That they know the team, they know the squad. Um, that that person's connecting the team. Um, the team's talking. He's delegating because you can't do shit by yourself. No, like I, I you, I you like you. You were unbelievable for me. Owen was unbelievable for me. George Ford, unbelievable. Everyone's, you know, like what George Ford does for that team. Um, whether he's starting or not, if if he's starting, the attacks taken care of. Yeah. If he's not, you, you look at the standards and training from the non twenty three. He's running that attack and, and testing the the we're talking about England yeah there. yeah testing that English defence the whole time so having those sorts of personalities I like, I use you as my henchman yeah <laughs> which is which is good in terms of uh, humour um, but equally defensive qualities whenever yeah. we needed to talk about that it was just something because I'm not good at it I'm not good at talking about that why not fucking employ someone that is good at that you know. Yeah. Uh, empower you but I think that but that, one of your key that makes you a good leader to do a, to do a job Th- that's intelligence to be able to do that because people don't do that but you also I think you balance out how the way you speak to people because that's another another thing is that and what I've an interesting talking to Eddie about it who came on uh, the podcast The Good The Bad and Rugby about Owen for example and how he's developed into a player now that understands the different levels of when to speak how to speak the different emotional intensity because that's not something you're trained to do are you? well <laughs> And again, like I kind of hope that our listeners are this way inclined, but just having like a growth mindset and understanding that anyone at 20 years old is not the finished article. No. I was 33 when I finished and I'm still trying to learn. So we're, we're so judgmental. We're, we're quick to judge someone saying, oh, he's not good enough. Like give it time. Like, yeah. People have got to learn. People got to make mistakes to actually learn and get better. Like we're, we're just, we're so kind of obsessed with like this refined product saying everything should be perfect no one should make high tackles yeah like owen at the moment no one should get penalties like these things happen the mistakes are always going to happen and players are always going to learn from mistakes so it's i think when you watch sport you just got to understand that everyone's on like a different part of their journey um whether that's captaincy or become like how many players play their first game international rugby and everyone goes oh he's crap yeah it's like you know, he, he, some coaches do it. Yeah. yeah, he is crap, and then he's cut. Yeah, never you've, got to, again. you've got to give some people time to to grow. You know, but um, also, do, how how often, apart from Eddie, were you helped to be a captain? Or was it just uh, expect? Yeah, none, none. So, but, so how how, for example, I, you know, I, I, again, when I go back to Owen, I think he's brilliant now, and I think that the nuances and the and ability. So I was talking to Will Carling, you know, that 
because he's so uh, uh, where almost a heart on his sleeve kind of character. Not everybody's like that. You you must have, have looked around the change room sometimes, and you felt fired up knowing that there's probably four or five players who aren't mentally in there. They drop their standards in training. You know, you could probably rely on them for a weekend, but it's the balance to understand that um, and, and to get to get it right. And I, I think it's just taken for granted. And I think that people expect to be good captains, but don't give you any help. I think you're kind of learning on the job. You are literally learning on the job what works, what doesn't. You know, and you can't put, sometimes, you know, it's like you train all week and you've trained like fire, you're on fire. Then at the weekend, you're flat, but then you win the game. And then the opposite, you know, you, you train crap all week and then you go out and you perform. And you can't, you, if you could solve that, you'd make a lot of money. Um, I think that the best thing that I learned was to be consistent with habits Okay. Um, and I think that is where a captain definitely and his, and and your leadership group or your senior players, whatever you want to call it, your generals, that is where they earn their money to to get consistencies from Monday through to Friday because performance is habitual, right? So you can't expect to play well every week if you train crap every week. So if you if you if you train Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday really well, chances are Saturday is going to go well. And that's where I think captaincy and, like I said, that leadership group earn their money because performance, to me, what I learned is habitual. You can you can take out those grey areas by by focusing on that kind of consistency in training, those habits, and that's what I learned with England. We we were so so good at. You told me something about Eddie, which really resonates, which I didn't I didn't realise that how many times do you start a season with a club or in business, get a whiteboard out, and you write something on a whiteboard. And you talk about it and you revisit it for two weeks and you never go again. You, you said something very different about the way, way Eddie does it, and I, I'd obviously noticed it in hindsight. Uh, you're talking about winning? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. Everyone talks about winning a, a competition, and um, he, he actually daily talked about winning. And this is the power of words that he spoke to me about. Uh, when, when you do media, talk about winning. Talk about how hard you train and why you train that hard, because you want to prepare yourself. So when you think if you hear a podcast with me or an interview or from on TV, if you're reading uh, an article and I'm talking about, and you know, my quotes are, we've prepared really hard because we want to win. The players are reading that and it reaffirms what they've just done. Yeah, we have trained hard, but we want to win. Mm. And we, we tiptoed around winning or the culture of winning for for four years under Stuart Lancaster. Yeah, um, We were too busy, in, in my opinion, uh, of being... Humble, trying to rebrand England rugby um, from from the fallout of the 2011 World Cup. Um, it was like a, a, a clean-up job. Re-education we, process, wasn't it? And he basically got rid of those key influences. Um, myself, you, you and Chris Ashton kind of held on yeah. um, by our fingertips, pr probably because we were young enough, and we went through the England rugby rebranding process. And then we got the evolution of the Ant Watsons, Jonathan Josephs, George Ford, Owen Farrells, all these guys kind of came through. And it was like a learned behaviour. There was no alcohol involved. Um, but, so I'm kind of going off tangent. No, no, I'll, I'll bring it back, I'll bring it back. We talked about how proud we were to play for England. Yes. Uh, how we respected the opposition. All these kind of rugby values of respect and humility. But Eddie kind of came in and went, you know, what are we talking about team culture for? Fuck it, we're, we're here to win. Let's talk about but, winning. But we we weren't saying those things for our benefit. We were saying them for the media and the rebrand. Yeah, but we, we got we got sheets like this, bullet points. Talk about how good the culture is. And I came from a culture at the time at Northampton where I couldn't even articulate what the culture was, but you could smell it, you could feel it. Yeah. Like you walked into Northampton, we were consistently um, in the playoffs every year. We were winning things, and we had that mob mentality. That was culture. So I came from a place where. I was a part of a great culture at Northampton and then I was being told to talk about this culture at England and it was fucking divisive. There was no culture, but we were told to talk about it, which made it made you kind of think you're, you're lying to yourself yeah. talking about but it. it. But I think if people talk, people try to talk about culture and it becomes paper thin because it, it hasn't naturally progressed. You can't make a team have culture. No, you can't. It's, um, it's something that develops over time. Um, but you developed it at Northampton almost... Like you said, the mob, that was your tool. It was it was you guys against everybody. But, but it came with time, you know. Yeah. Like I said before, like what I've learned from it is it, it's, a, it's a habit. You know, Monday you go out and you train a certain way. Might not be full on, but you've got certain habits. On Tuesday, you back it up with certain expectations. 
Um, and then when it came to performing, we had certain expectations or, you know, you just, you think about like credibility in rugby, like defensive credibility. You you know, if you've yeah. got no credibility in a rugby team, you don't last long. No. You you get outed in a, in a change room. So I think culture's built around those habits of, of credibility and training and then performing. And I think even if you win or lose, as long as you can look each other in the eye and you've got that credibility that you tried, it's almost like skill versus effort. Yeah. You know, I don't mind a skill error, but an effort error, like, you know, don't talk to me. So, so I give you, so well, first of all, I think, um, and, I, and I said this in the, in the book, you know, I think that I've never met a harder working bloke and, and, uh, than, than Stuart Lancaster in terms of his desire to make England a success. You know, he put incredible amounts of time in there. I think he challenged Eddie for his, his work rate and he's a, he was a lovely bloke. I think what... I'll second that. Yeah, for, 100% for, agree. But, 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 you know, for me, I think he got it wrong in that uh, in, the, in the England time because he spent a lot of time, and I don't envy him, he had an impossible task. You know, we were... After 2011, the laughing stock of every sporting world. We were talk, talked about as the worst touring team that's ever been. Or the best. Or the <laughs> depending on depending on how you look at it. Um, and you know, Stuart had to come and come and re-educate that. Where I think he went down, as I said, not having the personalities, not creating that environment or culture in inverted commas where you could speak up. But I'll give you an example. And I said I talk about it in the book is that we had. Uh, we had a meeting, right? And I got invited to a leadership meeting. Never been invited to one before. It was a big day for me, right? I've heard this. Yeah, and I, ca I came in, and first of all, I played uh, uh, two days before, so my body was fucked. I always get worse. Oh, I've heard this, but yeah, you're going to tell the story anyway. I'm going to tell the story yeah, anyway. For, for the pod. For the, for for the, the pod. pod mate. Yeah. Everything's for the pod. It's not for you, pal. Well, I'll just right? check my phone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, sitting on these um, horrific wicker wedding chairs because at Penny Hill they'd had, a, they'd had a thing. And the meeting was uh, about leadership, right? And it was about what. The idea was he would talk to his leaders. There was about 30 people in the fucking room, so there's too many anyway. And, it, and the idea was he would run by them what was going to happen in the next meeting. So I'm sitting there, my back's fucked. So I'm, I'm leaning over, trying to trying to look up. And he's got his pyramid out. He's talking about everything was all about team first, right? And I was like, we fucking heard this a million times. And he, and he says everything he's going to say. And he says, right, I'm going to present that to the guys next meeting. Everyone okay? Everyone goes, yeah. Right? No one challenges. No one says anything. It's just a meeting about the meeting. Uh, yeah, uh, you got to remember I had four years pre-World Cup with Lenny and those meetings existed. Yeah. Um, and it was just, and it was, and it was mad. And then, and then basically at the end of the meeting, Stuart came up to me and said, can I give you some feedback? And I thought he asked me to give him some feedback. So I went, yes, Stuart, it's a meeting about a meeting. And he went, no, no, I thought your body language was terrible. If we invite you into a leadership meeting, you need to sit up. And I went, but, and I just bothered, didn't bother explaining myself, right? I said, I'm not going to be defending myself. I said, yeah, no problem. Graham Roundtree, straight after the meeting again, Hask, what the fuck were you doing in that meeting? Your body language was terrible. I went, Wig, my back's fucked. I've been sitting on a hard chair. It was a meeting about a meeting. Next meeting we go in, they repeat exactly what they said. That's not fucking leadership. That's not asking people to have an opinion. That's just telling us what we're going to do in the guise of a leadership meeting. And for me, when the pressure came on and decisions are made around selection and training mentalities and the fact you couldn't talk to the coaches because everyone was a fucking alpha male, that's when the wheels come off, I think. And I, and, and I love Chris Robshaw. I think he's a brilliant guy. But again, I think he was in that that mould of not like you. I don't think he had utilised the guys around him. I felt it was very much like a parent teacher thing with him. But, you know, even though I think he's brilliant and I really like Chris, I think he's a fantastic player. I just don't think he was that strong. We needed someone stronger to deal with them. But I don't think he was ever going to pick someone to no, challenge him. I don't think he he would have had someone that would have challenged him. Um, I think it was his way, and it, I think the the shortcomings of it were when you are. Uh, he was in charge of that team and he, he kind of admitted that I think 40% of his time was dealing with media. Yeah. 40% of his time was dealing with sponsors and engagements like that. And then 10% was just, you know, like yeah, planning. Yeah. And then the other 10% might've been coaching. Yeah. And Lanny's a good coach. Yeah. Yeah. That's I thought, where he yeah. cut his teeth. Like yeah. And that's what he's doing now at Leinster. He's gone back to coaching. I just think it was probably a big job. Um, whoever took that job on post 2011 needed to clean it up. But yeah, to, to round it off, it basically, you, you ended up with a team that couldn't lead itself, uh, didn't really have a backbone. No. Um, and that was its its shortcomings. I also think as well, I think, you know, the, the maturity of the of the coaches and responsibility, I, you know, I'll give you an example because you were you were involved in it. We went to, um, away to Ireland playing a Grand Slam game under Stuart Lancaster. We lost. Came back in the change room. None of the coaches came in and spoke captain didn't speak everyone's sitting around looking for somebody you know as captain you can give your view on it looking for someone to put an arm around you people are on twitter straight away fucking shit hang yourself you can all this other stuff right no one came in fast forward a couple of years same thing happened we're in ireland we lose grand slam uh game we still win the fucking thing but we lose 
Eddie Jones comes in straight away, speaks. You sit up and speak. The difference between it was night and day was we still lost and everyone's still going through emotional roller coaster, but people stood up and were accounted for. And instead of sitting in the corridor giving us all stink eye when we feel bad, I love the fact that Eddie put his emotions to one side, how disappointed he would be knowing that his job was bigger than his personal emotions, and you as well. You know, you would be disappointed, whatever, you know, you had your own personal things about how you would have played, how you didn't play, whatever it might have been, but you still spoke. And that, for me, was the difference between the two. To, in, in, yeah. in, a, in a micro example so so I think leadership uh, it's like um, smooth seas didn't make a good sailor type thing yeah um, so so leadership's the hardest when it's it's, it's a tough time when you're losing games um, that's the time where you've got to stand up put your shoulders back lift your head up and look I, there'll be games that I haven't done that but the older you get the more experience you get you learn that whatever's just happened you can park it there's no point like there's nothing you can literally do about no. it Especially in that moment, you know, you're actually physically pretty sore and people are all fighting different battles. Did I play well? I mucked up. I missed this tackle. Everyone's kind of so self-critical. There's no point kind of concentrating no. on, on that. And I think that's what Eddie's so good at. And he's 60 years old. He's got that experience that there's no point in him coming in and blowing up. No. He, he knows that. He and, and he knows that the people in that room all look to him for... For, for guidance and for acceptance. And yeah. he sets the tone, right? And I learned this as well. So if I came in after a loss and I was kicking things and I was swearing and I had my head down and my hands for, for ages, if you if you pop your head up after that as, as a captain, you look around the room, that I'd say 90% of the room, bar the Sollies, the Sollies would be having a laugh. Yeah. Um, 90% of the room will be mimicking you yes. because you're setting the tone. Yeah. Whereas if you come in and just go, Look, boys, that was crap. You know, park it. Can't do anything about it now. Um, you know, pick your heads up. You know, put put your suits on and, and just you know let's enjoy the night or or whatever, and we'll deal with it on Monday. I think that's the best thing because then people can then breathe and and Eddie doing that as well. People know how to act um, after a loss. Um, but yeah, I think leadership um, is not not even as a captain, but as a senior player yourself, people or a key influencer. People look to you for for how to how to kind of act. How, how would you sum up your leadership style? Like, what would you say it is? Intuitive. Intuitive. Just trying to sensing what's right. Um, just going to... Um, again, I think it was born out of a, a place of credibility, maybe. Not because I was a, a, a great player or a great athlete or a great... Um, Got to get this word right. Orator. Yeah. Orator. Yeah, orator. right. Yeah, it's orator, yeah. Um just from a place of consistencies of training well and earning that credit and having kind of relationships with everyone in the team. Um, I think growing up in, in New Zealand helped. I mean, if you look at the England rugby team, half of it's Polynesian now. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, under, I understand, you know, the, the boys from Tonga, Samoa, um, you know, New Zealand, the Maori boys, I, I get those guys. And I think when you're trying to bring people together and understand different cultures and how people act, um, I think it's, that that helped. That that certainly helped. Um, but I, th I think you know leadership style. You you're always kind of um, you're always learning. And the thing I hate as well is um, is people say you know lead by actions. Yeah. And I hundred percent agree with that. And um, I know I look at teams and you got players who sometimes are one of the key players and they lead by action. But and everyone's like that guy should be the captain like we we're talking about mm. before. But that guy also needs to be able to communicate strongly as well. And people say like, oh, you can get guys that just talk shit. But in rugby, off the field, your captain, you do need to be able to communicate. Yes. You do need to be able to talk consistently. Because when you've got a quiet room, who's going to talk? The captain's always got to fill that void. Someone's got to fill that void. And people might roll their eyes at you know someone having to speak. But if that person, and I always felt like I'd, I'd leave the room quiet sometimes, hoping someone would speak. But then no one would, and you'd have to fucking surmise or yeah. round things up and and bring it all together. Because um, it, it's people sometimes actually almost do sit back sometimes and expect the captain to do everything to yeah. steer the ship. Because you know you said about it is interesting because I you know I sometimes players don't know how to feel or what to, to do, and like exactly like you said, for you to come in and it was interesting that Eddie. I mean I know he he's got into you your book book the hurt which is which is out now 
Um, you know, you've talked about how, you know, how much you owe Eddie, but how you had a very different relationship to Eddie than I had. He, he, he didn't raise his voice to the team, but he fucking raised it with you a few times. Yeah, but because he knew that um, I was a key influencer. So yeah. if, he, if he poked and prodded me, I would then, in a different way, kind of say, Hask, I need your help on this. Um, so-and-so, I need you to do this for me. So he put pressure on me, and that made me put pressure on myself and the people around me to deliver what he was he was it's just delegation basically and um it, it brought the best out of our team for for sure um and i think when you've when you delegate it it becomes everyone's got a role everyone's involved it's not just like you turn up and everything's laid out for you and you just go play whereas if you're in charge of the defense you you're accountable for that yeah you, you're prepared i'm making you be diligent with a notebook you're actually doing more analysis or preparing mentally for for training or that game and when you've got five or six people doing that you've covered off almost half the team and you've got more you've got basically more leadership i suppose or density they call it leadership density do you think now you, you came on the, my podcast good to bad the rugby when you talked about it's doing not, it it's not just yours wow say that it probably is i mean i, I let alex come along tins occasionally plays um because interesting enough a friend of mine jason tracy who, who you haven't met i've talked about him on some other podcasts he texts me after the episode with you and he said, "I fucking love the sound of Dylan. I wasn't sure about him. I never met. I never met him because people, you know, I didn't. wasn't sure. But what an interesting um, story. And I love the fact that he did everything on his own. So you talked about coming over from New Zealand on your own. Your mum and dad weren't around. Um, obviously, came to some games, but weren't around at your key thing, your fiftieth cap, your first cap, or any of these kind of moments. And I asked you on that show, had it shaped you the way you are? But actually, all the stuff you talked about." Do you think you are as good a leader as you were because of A, your initial start of having to find your own feet and resilience and B, the rocky journey you've had with media and with discipline and stuff? Do you reckon that shaped you and made you a more rounded leader? Yeah, I think it made me um, differently. I, I, I don't know if we need to put that into context, but with the the kind of, I don't need to retell those stories no, of, no. of how I got to here, but definitely just not having a, a perfect um a perfect story to that point. Yeah. Um, and do, do you know what the other thing is, is, is good, good coaches still seeing those qualities in you. Cause I got in trouble a lot and it would have been easy for them to go. Let's part ways. This isn't really working out, but Jim Mallander and Dorian West stuck with me throughout all those disciplinaries. I lost big games for the club, but also won big games with the club. Um, and if I hadn't had eight years of experience, captaining winning teams losing teams uh relegated teams um i wouldn't have been put into that position where eddie looked at the squad and went who's got captaincy experience uh dylan has mm. so kind of consistency or or backing from jim and, and dorian uh definitely led to that because i know you said eddie looked at the squad and was like you know who's got captain experience I, I just think that may have. Oh, I th well, I when, think when, when you look at who you're looking for, he, he wanted someone, in my opinion, without fingerprints on 2015 Rugby World Cup. <laughs> yeah, that was me. I was yeah. actually innocent. Yeah, I was. I was in no for part of that. Uh, yeah, um, and I'd had six or seven years of, of experience with Northampton, and I'd I'd played over 50 games for England at the time. So I was I was one of the senior players. So, and I was only supposed to do it for that opening tournament. Um, see I don't know this isn't really a question this is going to be more of a statement I don't think there's anyone else in that squad that could have done as good a job as you do you do you think of any, who, who, if he wasn't captain who else would you make captain I, I don't know I don't know I, I think whoever had done it Eddie drove such a a hard sort of um, program I think the team still would have produced and I would have been in that team and I, I would have played and it would have been great um, he shook up the trick i was basically a messenger um he said right we're going to mix this up we're going to train harder you being the oldest guy you're going to have to train the hardest you're going to be the example of work ethic so we're going to mix it up i still think the team would have gone on to be exactly what we were successful in, in those few years um and whoever was at the helm of it um and i was only supposed to do it for six months as well so obviously he did something that he liked um, I think it would surprise I, people. Asked, yeah, I don't know who else. Because I think it would sur surprise people it. who listen to this back to know how many layers you have to a your intelligence, but b your intuitive coaching. Because I, I, I think, and I know people were surprised on the good, the bad, and the rugby about you. You know, you, you in general. But I, I, you know, I knew 
I knew when I saw you captain, because I hadn't experienced in Northampton, that, that you were intelligent and, and intuitive as much more. But even I'm surprised as as how considered you are in terms of the different dynamics, the different levels, and also different stuff, because uh, it, now it all makes sense. But I, I think I think may all shock people, because I think some people just think captains is, like you said, just shouting. But I think it's pretty, pretty special what you did. No, this is where it's harder and it's easier to, to captain at club versus country. It's easier to, to captain at club because you're with your friends, you're with your partners who you, you, you know, blood, sweat and tears with every day. You, you lose, you train, you win, you know, you go on the bears, you build those relationships, you know, you know, wives, girlfriends, yeah. children, you know, it's so much easier to captain at club, but it's a lot more comfortable as well. Yeah. But then you go to England and it was hard because the group was pretty divisive. Yes. It, it wasn't yeah. It wasn't united. People had said things after twenty fifteen World Cup. <laughs> there were riffs. Fuck there, me, there were there, some riffs, yeah. Uh, there was club versus club kind of dynamics. Like I can't imagine any of the Leicester players like me or wanted me to be successful. But this is where captaincy at England is easy. If you don't come to the party, you can bugger off. Yeah. It's an aspirational group. Yeah. So if you drag your feet... It wasn't off, always aspirational, though. No, no, no. But Eddie made it yes. aspirational. Yes, He basically said, like, if anyone's comfortable here, or if you don't follow or listen to Dylan, basically, he didn't have to say this, but if I said to Eddie, like, I'm not getting the buy-in from this guy, or this guy's attitude stinks every day, he's not talking to me, or, you know, that'd be gone. Yeah. So I think... I didn't have to say it, but everyone had that big shake-up. Eddie gave it the big shake-up saying, you can all play and win for England and win a World Cup, or you can all bugger off and go back and play for your clubs. And, he, you know, Eddie knows how to motivate people. He said, I don't know what your motivation is. If it's financial, you can go earn money in France. But if you want to earn good money, you can stay here and play for England. So he kind of taps into everyone's psyche. And that's why captaining was hard with Eddie because of how he drove it. But it was also easy because whatever I said got done. You know. Do you remember that time? Can, Hask, can you take care of that? Yeah. And you wouldn't go, no, 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 no. Because Eddie would be like, why is that not done? I said, I asked Hask to do it, but he hasn't delivered. Hask, you go on, <laughs> mate. But that, that, that's the thing no, how yeah. easy it was. Everyone, everyone was like, yes. Uh, um, uh, Johnny May called it Eddie the master and he called me the king. I, I was the king mm. and I, I had many hands to the king. But I think you, I, we've had some England captains who essentially we nicknamed the puppet. I've named him in the, I've named him, but I won't do him in the podcast. But we said that basically, you know, it was like the coach had his hand up his ass and was fucking working his mouth. While, yes, Eddie steered the ship, which I think is really important, again, in leadership from someone at the top. If someone at the top doesn't dictate the game plan, doesn't give you the parameters, you get fucking lost. Everyone always says about team-led stuff, but you still need a fucking direction as to where you're heading. You need like a map coordinate. But I felt that you spoke always with your own and were given the remit to be your own person and shape things in terms of the dynamic because the structure within the group, there was a really good atmosphere. How, how did you maintain the atmosphere and make everybody kind of, you know, really enjoy being part of England? Uh, again, I think it was small wins. I'm, I'm just trying to think about small wins that I got, you know, like um, post-match dinners and that, uh, I basically went to Eddie and said, these are really bad. <laughs> and he was like, okay, good. Talk to Fran uh, and, and Charlotte, who are our managers, and they basically negotiate us then to be in there for like half an hour. So we used to be in there for a couple of hours and would be pleasing the council members, and you know, yeah. But all of a sudden, it was like small wins, and then it was um, almost like the the budget, the the purse strings are being loosened. You know, we were eating out again a couple of times a week if we wanted. Yeah, days off, things were put on, and I think it's just small wins for the boys that they, they come from such a. Uh, regimented background. Reg yeah. yeah, it was almost like an institutionalized regimented yeah. background with with Stuart. And then like things just loosened up a bit. We started having a bit more fun. Eddie kind of, um, we, we we spoke together and we allocated kind of uh, socials. They were forced, forced socials. And Eddie said, "You, if you want to drink, you can drink." And he talks about like when he was with South Africa, like the the big Afrikaans boys were getting pissed on a, a Wednesday night before a Test match, and he loved it. He absolutely, he's like, "If you boys want to do that, you can do that." You just got to train hard the next day. And he always told stories about George Smith and um, Bucky's, and you know all these people that used to kind of 
work hard, play hard yes, type yeah. thing, and then work hard. George Smith, I, I, I'll give you an example. George Smith would probably, was probably the best player I ever played with and would go out on a weekend, put himself in a body bag, come in Monday, put one of them training masks on, get on a Watt bike, just fucking scream his demons into the mask and then go be ready to train and be the best player that weekend. Yeah, but th- 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 that's what he loved. And yeah. he said, if you want the team to be that, it can be that. But because of the four years under Lanny, you've got all these kind of, I, I'm going to call them England Academy. It's a bit patronising. <laughs> but yeah. the England Academy, you know, all the, the new blood, the, yeah, the, yeah. the Owens, the 40s, all yeah. these guys kind of came through. They didn't come through in the booze culture like we did. Yeah. So they, by the time we got to Eddie saying, yeah, mate, go out and drink. Every social we went to, we'd have these booked rooms and there'd be buckets of beer. Everyone would just have like a Coke. Yeah. Uh, or you, or you, maybe you and I'd have one beer we, or something we, like that. We would purposely have one. Yeah. Uh, we'd have a meeting before like me you um, a couple of the other boys and would say guys I want you to have a couple of beers tonight because we're actually having a couple yeah. of beers I want you to again people are looking to the older people the, the influences on how this is going so we go and we say I mean, a couple of beers other people loosen up and have a couple it's okay um, so I think just small wins um, throughout and just sort of treating the guys like like humans for one and like grown grown men and they're not grown men. They're still you know, yeah. early 20s. Because, because and- everything in rugby is a, t- a parent-teacher or teacher-student relationship. If you think about it, we always have a boss. We're always accountable, whether it's to each other. And it is sometimes, you know, that's why I've always wanted to, with the MMA stuff before it all got fucked up because of COVID, was to be an individual sportsman for once. Yeah. And not have that. I mean, I still have my my coaches, but everything we do is is you know you're made accountable. You're, you're told off. And some of these kids who come through, yes, they've been playing for international rugby. They're still fucking told what to do, how their ass is wiped. It's, yeah. it's 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 hard. The, the other thing I think in, in terms of the environment is like breaking down barriers. Um, and this is where kind of like those little one to one conversations. I, I noticed some people would be in each other's pockets, best friends, and yeah. they wouldn't mix with the rest of the group. And it went. Um, it coincided that they were club mates as well. So it just looks bad when you have got three yeah. or four players from one club that all stay in one room together. They walk, they eat together. So I just sidle up to them and go, hey, I've just noticed this. Can, can you do me a favor and, and can you make an effort to, I'm going to challenge you to try and eat with someone different every time this week. And I'll do all that behind behind the scenes. And um, Do you find did you find challenging people hard? Not not always being popular? No, no, because that, that, that was, I think publicly challenging people is hard, but one-on-one is easy. Fine. You just got to find a way to, to open. And I think if it comes from a place of good, if you're doing the right thing, the good thing, for the team, and I was always trying to do that mm. for the team, it, it's always received pretty well. Um, I was thinking about Eddie as well. Like, we, we'd come from, you know, let's have a meeting about a meeting about a meeting. But then Eddie would have these meetings and um, he would start them 10 minutes early and Courtney would walk in like a minute before the meeting and he wouldn't get in trouble. Eddie would just carry on talking and Courtney would sit down and start taking his notes and if Courtney missed out 10 minutes worth of notes, you'd have to pick them up. Yeah. And Eddie didn't say, you're, you're late, mate. He was just he was just letting them know that it's probably an expectation to be there a bit earlier. But he's never called out on it. Yeah. And it'd get to a point where uh, Guzzy or Borthers done a meeting and Eddie would go, that's 15 minutes, mate. <laughs> and like all the boys would be laughing. But before that, it was like a classroom. Yeah. Like if you spoke out uh, about anything, it, you'd be pulled up like you were. Yeah. You know, wh- why are you speaking out? Yeah. Whereas Eddie just, you know, so Borthers is up the front trying to do his like analysis and Eddie's like bouncing a ball at the back of the room <laughs> and he's coming up to me and goes mate did you watch Love Island last night and I'm going uh, 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 did, did you see the tennis and I'm like trying to watch Borthers <laughs> and trying to give Borthers the, the respect that he, yeah. he deserves for his meeting and then Eddie then his phone goes <laughs> off and <laughs> mate. he just do you know what he just brought humour he relaxed the environment yeah. people started being themselves um, broke down the barriers uh, we we all broke down the barriers together, um, and I just think it became a happy place to be. It wasn't like an uptight, um, tucked in environment. No. I remember the coaches' previous regimes would all eat on one table, like Eddie. One minute it's like screaming at you for not getting low enough in, in a breakdown drill ten times in a row, and then after training, he says much better, you know, good. Yeah. And then he sat next to me talking about you know sport. He's asking how my daughter yeah. is and. He just made it a whole lot more personable. Like, was he the best coach you ever worked with? Yeah, hundred percent. But I think he's only that because of the time of my career and probably his time as well. Yeah, he he he's been around like for, for forever. So he's experienced rugby on different continents. He's 
He's coached and won World Cup finals. He's just got experience. And I've got no doubt that any other coach, when they're 60 to 70 years old, yeah. they would have learned those lessons. But some people don't learn, though. And they thought they fall apart. I think the very fact he's still coaching, it shows that he's on a path of well, he, self-development. Well, he's got that growth. Yeah. Yeah, he's, but, whatever he reads, he used to send on to me. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. So when you became a... You were obviously a, a leader, but when you became a serious leader, when I'm saying about with... With England, who did you look up to as, as leadership? Because Eddie would go and speak to Pep Guardiola and 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 you know uh, whoever it might be, Gareth Southgate or Sir Alex Ferguson. Who did you look up to as your leader, leader inspiration? Again, just the people around me, people that I um, ultimately respected. Um, but who would that like? Give me an example. Well, of who I that might know. be? Um, just interested to see what you'd who you'd who you'd gravitate towards. No, I think it was just reading and. Um, and it was all fed by Eddie. And then um, there was a great book, like The Captain's Class came out. I, I suggest you read that. And it's funny that we're talking about leadership and captaincy and and me. But um, I tick a lot of those boxes. Basically, not not the best player. Get the guy who's quietly moving in the background, connecting people. I, I actually went through and um, a lot of those kind of qualities resonated with me. Um, it's funny the other day, I had quite a big um, clear out of... of uh, a box of stuff and I found like a, an old England backpack and I kept all my notes and I could have sunk like England rugby like but yeah. it's, it's all a couple years yeah, old yeah yeah I know what like, you mean yeah on how they kind of but I burnt it all um what was the question oh yeah and I found like newspaper articles that Eddie had given me or printouts that he'd given me and um you know it, I'd get things delivered to my room envelope under the door with so he's constantly like thinking yeah. about you which is quite cool but he used to give me books as well and he gave me this one book um on on baseball it's really it's like this book like this and it's on baseball he's like read that mate best book i've ever read and i was like okay cheers and then i looked at it and i went it's like brand new no one's read this and i was like has he read it but bought me that book and then i found that in my backpack the other day and i burnt it um <laughs> but i never read it and he always he always said to me like how's that book going i'd always say good but i had so much on my like plate i had no time to read do you reckon he ever fucked with you yeah, hundred percent. Like he, he just someone I'd obviously told him that that was a good book. Yeah. So he passed it on. But then I have like the other day when I caught up with him, I was like, "Did you um, did you did you ever read that that baseball book?" He's like, "Nah, mate." So like, <laughs> or, fucking... or, yeah, but you know, like you, in, but... in the time he was just like that, 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 and because knowing you as I do, and, and you know me, if we were ever given that responsibility, I know it would be tempting, but we definitely fuck around. I'd play games. You yeah. would play games. Was it, was it um was it Dick Best at London Irish used to hold um like Monday morning meetings or reviews, and he'd have a clipboard, and it'd be like Haskell. How many tackles did you miss at the weekend? You'd be like oh, uh, 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 three, <laughs> yeah. and he'd be like. Hmm. And, there's, and he puts the clipboard down and there's nothing on it. <laughs> Apparently he did that with like all, all sorts of things. But yeah, I, if I was in that position of of, yeah. of authority, I would love to play those sorts but of games. I, I mean, because I, I, I just wonder, because Eddie, you know, again, for people who aren't rugby fans who, who are uh, listening to this, Eddie texts you in the morning. Did he text people in the morning and he expect you to fucking answer? Uh, yeah, I mean, my, my actual day started with, I actually knew it would always be drop in and see me. I'd always get that. Um, it, you know, six, seven in the morning. So my day always started with, you know, wake up and I'll be like, right, I'm going in there. And I was thinking, his his that meeting would define my day. You know, what mood is he in? Is he is he wanting to spike the team a bit? Because for the team to spike training, it would come through me. So he'd go in and be like, yesterday was terrible. I'm trying not to swear because the last podcast I I did with you, I swore too much. Oh, I yeah. listened back to it and I was like. I felt like me and you were in the pub together. Yeah, but that's what we want. No, no. Fuck it. Don't uh, worry about it. <laughs> yeah. no, so, so, so I'd come in in the morning and be like, yesterday was shit, mate. Um, you know, you weren't good enough. The, the, these KPIs aren't good enough. The team, why are we even bothering? Like, we shouldn't even play this weekend. We, we might as well just give the result. That, that sort of thing. Right. So it was almost like that reverse psychology. Then I'm like, okay, I, I know what it is. So, but like, you, so you and didn't know I what And then I go out and then I'm like, right, Owen, James, 40, um, Danny Kerr, you know, boys, I need you today. Um, the the boss isn't too happy. We, we just need to make sure that our habits and the standards are really good in training today. But equally, there's someone as I go and it'd be like, really good today or, or yesterday that, you know, there's more of the same today. Yeah. But then, you, you know, I see him. We're in the indoor center. And I, I had a massive thing about standards. I hated rubbish. 
Yes. I hated rubbish. I, I hated that, water yeah. bottles, like single use water bottles. I'm like an eco warrior. Um, we, I flagged that. We actually flagged that up, didn't we? Didn't we? You know, it was something you were quite. Sure. I said to myself, "Why can't we just get you know recycle or a recycling bin? Give everyone and make everyone accountable yeah. for for their water bottles, yeah. you know? Because at home, if you're thirsty, you get a drink, and all yeah. of a sudden here, people just start like, knock the cap off a a, a 500 mil bottle, sit the top, then throw it on the floor, and it's done. It's dust. So I hated that, but my heart would sink where post training. Um, this is the other thing like I'd always be last to leave the training ground most days because I'd be worried about the rubbish if I let like out the corner of my eye mid training I see Eddie picking up some tape um, and then I just know like after training be like it's, it's disgusting down there mate like the players don't care standards are sloppy and I, I agree with this like you start cutting corners off the field you start cutting corners on the yeah. field it's all it's all like a it's a mantra it's a habit isn't yeah. it of how but that's you what you said about the winning the winning part it, it is a habit everything if you don't if you're not prepared to put attention detail in uh yourself and in the way you treat others why the fuck would you put that for him to help the team 100 percent. so I, I was you know was, and and club or country people probably got sick of this but i banged on about it so much you know like we used to go in that spa people were paying like four or five hundred quid a night to stay at that spa and we bowl down. There's boys just peeling off their tape, taking their protein yeah. drinks down there, leaving it on the side. Yeah. And that really annoyed me. But equally, it annoyed Eddie as well. But it would come via me. So I'd have to stand up in front of the team and like, we should be talking about rugby or something fun. Yeah. But I'm there moaning about rubbish. And it's like, oh, fucking hell, the eco warriors talking about rubbish again. It's like, but I just knew if the rubbish continued, Eddie would um it'd be coming down my channel and I'd have to sort it. So some days after training, like I'd hang around and do my throwing with Borthers. Yeah. And at the end of that, like so everyone's bugging off to the spa. I've done extra throwing or an extra conditioning top up like I had to do. <laughs> um extra two thousand calories Mate, burnt. Um, mad. And then I'd spend like half an hour walking around the facilities. Kind of just making sure. You should have fucking asked me to come and help. No, you. no, but I did. I, I I brought the broom in, didn't yeah, I? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, we We'd the, sweep everything, didn't we? No, but we had passed the broom. So yeah. I started with the broom one day. Every day in the training center, I started with the broom. And then I'd hand you the broom. And then the next session, you'd sweep the room. But the weird thing is the broom never got past me. If you ever, <laughs> I was fucking flat out. No, but it did. It was, yeah. it was a good way to be yeah, accountable. If you got given the broom, it's your job it's to It's amazing how though, though, some, some other players would always just walk by and never do anything. Oh, I don't know how you do that. I couldn't, do, I couldn't see you sweeping up without asking to help. But some yeah. people are just oblivious. Don't give a shit. And some people just peel the tape off and throw it on the floor. I'd, I'd hate to see how some people live. You know, like just well, their I, personal standards. I used to have a player in France that um, got ill. And he, um, the doctor came around to his house and he had a lump growing out of his head, a massive lump. It looked like a Vulcan or a Klingon. And uh, the, the doctor complained to the club that he was living in unsanitary Squalid. conditions. Like, how bad do conditions have to be for a doctor to report you to your own club? Like, I can only imagine what it was like. And I don't understand how some players do that. Like, even when I was in the jungle and I'm a celebrity... The way I dealt with it was doing jobs, right? So getting water. But people would fucking watch the water run out, would watch me go up and down there six or seven times they carrying water and never offer to help. Where it, but some people did, but some people didn't. Yeah. Uh, in the team environment, you would... I'll tell you what, there's always someone that would do it. Yeah. And there's always someone that would... And I got to that point where I got sick of asking. And not, it wasn't that bad. But like would have lapses. Yes. And instead of having like a big cry to the team, I'd just I'd just <laughs> do, clean do it, it up. Yeah. But if it, if it was consistently happening, I'd I'd lose my, my rag. But um it's funny, I'm just gonna go off on a tangent there. How I I know me and you bang on about how professional the game that we played is yeah. and how much money is involved with it, but how unprofessional it is. Yeah. So like I won't name the club, but I've got a fairly good experience with them. Um <laughs> <laughs> You do the math, no, no. listen yeah. at home, yeah. No, no, but like I found it obscene like crazy for the whole time there like if anyone's been into a rugby change room it is like a pro it is it is it's a petri dish of, of death yeah there's so much going on there and you, you go in and recovery facilities so you've got hot tub ice baths yeah. all these things thousands of pounds worth of equipment yeah but the whole club is employed like they've got like two cleaners or three cleaners these lovely ladies that kind of just potter about all week cleaning up from games yeah um, you know, fourteen thousand people coming in the ground, and that that kind of cleaning up the the, the stadium, and then they've got to do the change rooms. And rugby players are feral, feral you know, like mate. They, they train in their their kit, obviously. Then they go get in the hot tub in those same pants that they've trained oh, in, or the ice baths. And there's like 
there's like um layers of, of scum like at the top of these things and the boys just get in there i know and I some boys went, don't also shower I, I actually complained in my last year i brought hr down and i said this is pre-covid as well i was like this just isn't right the toilets don't have natural light or ventilation in oh. them. It's like, but also, I talk, what about the what about the locker next, like poo corner? <laughs> poo like, corner. like any new player that turned up had poo corner. But I it? thought you'd stuff me in poo. I thought when oh, you first came in, you looked out, after me. Fuck me, because when you wound me up, going, I'm sticking in poo corner. I thought I know Dylan's ruthless, and and, and as I said earlier, I, I have always admired you because you always did what was good for the, the best for the team and weren't frightened if somebody didn't like you or were, you weren't as popular because some captains I've been with is a popularity contest but they're not getting the job done you won't have a problem with people going fucking hell Dylan's a bit aggressive but you were getting the job done when you said to me I'm going to stick you in poo corner I honestly was like that with Chloe I had that moment at home I was like oh please. no I couldn't, I couldn't do that to you, you, you I was down see, you're a key influencer yeah. you're a key influencer I, I needed you uh, keep your friends but close but what is it about rugby <laughs> yeah. let, me, let me finish yeah, the, sorry. the hygiene story so Rugby is professional. All this you've got players that are paid five hundred to a million pounds now yeah. per season. But the facilities at the club don't even have a cleaner, don't even have a pool guy come and chlorine the, the spa pool. Yeah. The kit man is employed <laughs> to do it. And the academy players have to assist him. Yeah. And I've been an academy player. I've got no interest in cleaning the hot tub. Like so you've got like these facilities. You've got ten grand a pop ice bath. So there's two of those. Then you've got a ten grand hot tub. Yeah. You've got thirty grand's worth of equipment. You've got a kit man, an academy players, <laughs> who, let's be honest, they ain't cleaning them every no, week. No. And if you've got forty to fifty people going through these things potentially daily, they probably need servicing daily. It's like you spend all that money on your assets, but the infrastructure to help those assets recover. It, it, you know, there's no money no. put into that. It's like, oh, we'll buy the kit. That's that's enough. But no, these are maintenance. Mate. And that just blew my mind. I actually got to a point where uh, it's probably why I had to retire. I could sue them for damages, right? They're liable. Because <laughs> I didn't have recovery yeah, facilities yeah, yeah. because there was bloody gonor- gonorrhea bloody just simmering on the surface. <laughs> and, you know, oh, it's Legionnaire's disease in the hot tub. Mm. But I, 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 you're, you're exactly right. I think it's probably a whole nother show. When, if we get another series, I'd love to get you on to talk about the, the actual professional nature of sport and how players aren't, aren't looked after. Uh, and all, but also, you know... No, but some... we, we've got to be careful that we're not moaning. No, I don't want to moan. I don't want to moan. Because people just choose what they want to hear. Yeah, you know what uh, I mean? No, I'm not... They don't actually see the message that we're, we're trying to make or improve yeah. or protect. But also just telling the truth. Look, you're right, you know, that that you, you're, you've got players with commodities and there's absolutely no hygiene. But also, I do think players... <laughs> no themselves, hygiene. There is, it's, it's one of those weird things where there's always a player in a club who just comes in and sh- fucking destroys a toilet. And I just understand how do they... He just leaves like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't understand. Is in his living room or in his, in his toilet, has he just shat down the front of his own toilet or on top of the cistern and left it? Because why would you do that as something else? Why would you look like you... It looks like someone grabbed the top of the toilet, vaguely spun with their pants off, crapped on the wall on the back of it, and then left it, didn't flush it, and then walked off. There's someone walking around who's had a massive turd, doesn't oh, wipe their ass. Can I just say, wherever I go to the toilet, wee or poo, I have an etiquette check. Yeah, you know, of course. Like, I, I leave that place like cleaner than when I Agreed. came in. Agreed. So there was one day that someone had pooed on the seat. <laughs> and I actually, this is what I mean, like going to a team meeting to talk about analysis <laughs> or being better at rugby. Yeah. And I've had to start with a meeting with like, seriously, who's <laughs> shit on the seat? Like, we've got to come here every day. We spend more time here yeah. than we do at home. Can we please like make it a pleasant pay- place to go for a poo? Mate, I've, like, I've, I've had somewhere. I, I've got, I got to a point where I would go into the stadium and find like the women's toilets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Me the match too. day women's toilet because there's... There's like 30 of them. They're the cleanest Clean, toilets yeah, I know. in the world. Men's like, women, toilets women are, are brilliant. I know. Women, mate, I would do the same thing. Try and have a quiet dump in a nice, serene atmosphere where it doesn't look like someone spray diarrhea at the wall. But also, I, I, if I go to the bathroom, when I come out of it, if, if I've gone in and someone skidded it up and I'm leaving, I don't want to be associated. I've got to clean it. You've got, got, clean you've it. got to hope that no one's at the door <laughs> thinking that that was you. Yeah, that's what I mean. So I can't deal with it. I have to clean it. Oh um, but we'll round this up because we, we, we both want to go we'll get some food. Poo. And we talk about poo. Just... Obviously, in business and in life, in in every area, um, you can put leadership stuff in there. What would you give as your three kind of almost key leadership tips to to somebody or to to, to people? Uh, You said about being intuitive. uh, uh, The first one is I'm not an expert, but this is what's worked for me. Um, Intuitive. um, Trying to have like a good moral compass, trying to do the right thing. Um, 
and we we talked a bit about this like making good choices the right choices and the other one is probably just being the example um show people that you're working and i think if if you're a boss uh, you should be you know let your let your employees know or, or let your players know like eddie's first and last to leave like he's working hard and when when the top or the captain is working hard it only trickles down you know you, you can't ask people and i think if you've got that kind of credibility and that credit with with your people um when you ask them to do something it's a whole lot easier um it's not just a uh, an out of the blue kind of request to to help with something if you're constantly um kind of gaining that credibility by spending time with people having a little check in how you're doing um do you know what like every time you make yourself a cup of tea make two yeah and drop one just drop it in front of someone and just say i was thinking about you and it's not being disingenuous but it's just buying those little bits of credibility you know carrying people's bags um cleaning up their maintaining standards yeah just yeah. i think you can buy credibility um i think one can... I, haven't, I haven't given you three concise points no no but no, it, ramble, no but, but no, there's no, a whole no. lot of things and do you know what it comes down to i think it comes down to people um being able to communicate with people and, and talk to people um because if you can say the the, the difficult things uh, the nice things are so much and and don't forget to say you know the, the positive stuff as well yeah um because you know feedback's normally all negative shit yeah it's always like oh, i'll do this better or you know could you do this or sit like you know the feedback you got in your leadership meeting like how often do we give people feedback for good things yeah we don't do we like you know but we're obsessed with um the juicy stuff the one caveat I will say to you just about the, the, the lead by example thing. It's interesting living in, in, in Japan. The Japanese leadership culture is very much like if my boss is working, if my boss stays late, I stay late. But actually, it's it's working hard, but, but working with a plan because I would go there and you'd go into the coach's room and the coaches would be sitting there because the boss hadn't gone home. They'd all be sitting there doing absolute fuck all. Oh, but only because the pretense was that they had to stay because that, it was the right cultural, thing to do. That's a cultural yeah. thing. I it think. was a it was a cultural we're, thing. We're lucky I, we've got shit culture. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, like, my just, job's done. See ya. But I just think it's important because you know being seen to be working is actually working smart and working with a plan, not just fucking. Because I, I know people who you know you know will, will always advertise that they're working hard. But are they working smart and actually working for the team? No, probably not. So it was only just an adjunct to what you said. Oh, about, about, there's you know. a good example of that in rugby. Like um, it actually broke me on a, a two days a week, Tuesday, Thursday sessions with with England. I was physically drained. You know, I couldn't wait to get in an ice bath and and get in my bed. You know, yeah. and boys would do pickups after training, and I could I was like limping off the field at that point. I was I was drained, and that's. I always kind of walked off knowing that if Eddie, Borthers, Guzzy, anyone said to me, um, and no one ever did, but if someone ever said to me, are you not doing any extras? I'd say, no, I've done what I needed to do today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, P.S. I was up this morning doing extras. I was anyway. in Eddie's at six getting the mood set today and I yeah. was already doing, yeah, you're right. But I, I think it's having that um, conviction in yourself because um, a lot of people hang around and do extras because everyone else is. Yeah. And I would just beeline off the field. Yeah. Um, I'd talk to Eddie, debrief training with him quickly, you know, what could we do better tomorrow? What was what was his observations? And then I'd I'd confidently kind of leave. Yeah. Um, you know, picking up rubbish along the way and, and whatnot. So th there was days like that and I look around, there's some people just Mate, doing was a things lot of people, for the yeah. sake of doing things. Yeah. And also doing it because I've seen people where I would I did a lot of my extras that I did them every day throughout my entire career right in front of where Eddie is <laughs> right right in Eddie's bedroom anyone is extras extras um, anyone and uh, and uh, I, I would basically um, well, there's no, I'll tell you there's no secret you, you did tackle extras just about every day some form yeah. of it and there's 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 something there if, if, if you're an aspiring rugby player or anyone if you want to get good at something if you do it every day it, it was your USP yeah, yeah. tackle yeah. technique and, and, we would and do, banging you know, people was your thing you know and, and you know and I, I just split the game up with those core skills and did and did them but but it was done out of my desire to be better, not for any show. But I would do some extras, and I would see players in my positional competition go to walk off, see that I was doing them, and then come back because they'd seen a coach. And it's like the guilt. They got the, the guilt. guilt. They got yeah. the guilt. But you know, um, look, Dylan, you've been amazing. I think anyone who who is interested in leadership's got to listen to this this podcast. I've got, you know, or pooing, or pooing. Yeah, hygiene standards. Your books just come out. 
Uh, where pe- where can people get that? Um, I think it's sold out in Waterstones. So don't go there. Or Sorry about actually, that. I don't want to do them over. I think they had like three per store. By the time this comes out, it will be out of back uh, at Waterstones. Online audio, uh, Kindle, Amazon, uh, out the boot in my car. Uh, Just don't come around my house asking to sign it. How's it, go- how's it gone down? It's funny, uh, you've obviously done a couple of books, but people think I've got a fulfillment kind of facility at my house. Yeah. People are like, DMing me, texting me, saying, "Can I get a couple books, please?" Yeah, yeah. I'm just like, that's weird. My favorite thing is I've ordered a book from Waterstones. Where, 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 where it's coming? How the fuck would I know? Uh, you know, but but, but so- no, please, um, please, please buy the book. Um, different to yours, uh, I think. I've I've tried to give an an insight. And I've got to give it a little plug here. It's called The Hurt. I've tried to give an insight into the physical and attrition, uh, like mental attrition that we go through in the game, and only tell it through my eyes of what I experienced because I think I experienced most things in the game uh in the english game particularly uh so yeah i just try and give an insight not to saturday but more the the monday to, yeah. to friday kind of stuff that no one sees and how's it gone down um honestly really good and i didn't think uh it would be this i never wrote it to be this thing but it's proving to spark debate about a few things which me and you are quite passionate yeah. about and I think one of those debates is player welfare, aftercare, things like that. And for those uh, intelligent people that can see through the, not me and you trying to create media headlines or promote our own books, but to see that we're just trying to promote player welfare and protect our friends that are playing the game and my kids, if they choose to play the game and the next generation of game, if they if we can provide aftercare and a solution can be born out of our statements or our stories... I think uh, it protects rugby going forward. So, yeah, read the book. There's a few funny stories in there. Not not as many as what a flanker, but um. <laughs> and you've got an audio book as well. On yeah, I, d- I didn't read it though. Fine. Uh, apparently, it's quite weird. <laughs> <laughs> oh, My story was some other guy reading it. I love um, to listen to it, but but also people can find you on uh, Instagram. Yeah, uh, Dylan Hartley. Right, perfect. I, I don't really um post anything to suit my demographic well, man, i think but. people will be blown away by this by this podcast hopefully dylan hartley thank you so much for having me the hurt ladies and gentlemen uh, my name is james haskell my book what a flank is out it's available as an audio book can i write. get one yeah i'll give you one please I, thank I, you. I actually gave my copy of nick and julia but i've got one over the week sorry right. uh, we'll catch you all soon